Hi, and welcome back from your lunch break. I hope you're all still awake and uh, are not going to fall asleep because you ate too much. Um, when, uh, when I got the positive confirmation that I was to speak here, uh, one of the first things I did was I wanted to know what the hotel was like. So I found out uh, what the hotel was called, and then I w uh, googled and find, found their website, and then I asked myself, hmm, I usually get nervous before a talk, might be good if I do some sports, do they have a gym? And so I scrolled through their site, and then they said, yeah, we have the best gym 24-7, blah, 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 blah. But I was wondering, do they have the machines that I use? Didn't say in the text. So what did I do? I went through the image gallery and crazy clicked until I found some images of their fitness studio and discovered the machines that they had were the machines that I wanted. And then that's a completely personal, embarrassing thing. I don't want to ask hotel staff where the gym is. It's just something I don't do. I feel highly uncomfortable asking where the gym is. So I also needed to find out, well, how do I get there? So I know the gym is the one I want, how do, how do I get there? And then I had this little clue here. If you pay attention to that screaming rock and roll face in the top left corner on the wall, you'll notice that it repeats in the bottom right, and that is the reception area. So that gave me the clue, the gym is right behind the reception desk. So now I knew I wanted to use that gym, and I knew where it was, and I was a happy camper. And that is something that I realized lots and lots and lots of people do when they book accommodations, be it hotels or Airbnbs. They use images to, ask, to answer questions that the texts couldn't convey. And also, uh, we learned that you really nobody wants to go any place until they've seen it before. They don't want to book a hotel room if they haven't seen the hotel room. They don't want to. They don't want to go into a pool. They don't want to book a hotel for a pool if they haven't seen the pool. They might end up with a jacuzzi instead of an Olympic swimming pool. So people have the desire to know what does it look like where I'm going, and um, does the does the hotel have the features that I want? Because clearly text doesn't always convey this. So at Trivago, we we cater to that need. We know that our users want to consume images because without the images they won't book at all. So we, have, we, have, we are faced with having to ship over 40 million uh, different, 47 million actually, 47 million different images of for over 6 million hotels. So that is a lot of traffic, a lot of data for like 9 million daily users. And we need to make sure that these images look nice and ship fast and are convincing. So and that is why what brought me here today, because we... Are, well, we're never at the end of a journey, but we're very, very far ahead in the journey of how to optimize images for this consumation. And um, we, we had a couple of very interesting lessons. Actually, I've managed to compile 12 of them by now. 12 lessons that I brought to you today that we had in the last year about what can you do to images to make them more appealing and faster loading for your users. So um, one of the things that, uh, that we... Uh, that we learned, for example, is that we have lots of different contexts in which images are shown. So, for example, the desktop views, the mobile views, uh, galleries that are vertical, galleries that are horizontal, um, galleries that only show subsets of images, these kinds of things, fly-out galleries, galleries in uh, Google Maps view. So we know our images are exposed to lots and lots of different contexts. So we realized we needed good cropping mechanisms, we needed good, uh, we needed right fitting sizes, we needed to consider all the devices that images were shipped to and also maybe the network conditions because not all users are on fast networks all the time. Um, we, like I said, we were, we're, we've been doing this for a while and um, we've got so good at it that last week we actually got a shout out at Google I.O. because of it. Because in the last year we managed to drop our image size by 80%. Uh, with the combination of techniques while still making our images very appealing. So in the performance technology track on Google I.O., we got a very friendly shout out from a couple of performance nerds who love the way we optimize images now. So we got really, really good at it. So I want to share with you how we got there and maybe also show you um, how you can get there. So the first thing we needed to realize is um, images have a huge workflow. And we need to focus our energy of optimization there where it matters most to our users. To our users. One thing that, we, that I personally, for example, really did not, uh, did not understand how complicated that is, is image sourcing. Like, where do the images come from? How, do, how are they stored? How are they tagged? How are they managed? How are they updated? It's an entire part of the image's food chain that I, as an image optimization um, engineer, have not considered before. 
But for our users, of course, what really mattered were areas like optimization and delivery and rendering. So these are the three areas I'd like to discuss with you today. We also then had to think about what are the actual problem areas our users are experiencing when they uh, are encountering images. So we looked at some data. This is HTTP archive for the top one million of the Alexa websites. And this is um, image growth in terms of HTTP requests and byte size over, over time. And as you can see, images are growing and growing and growing in terms of byte size. So by now they actually make up the lion's share of all the, um, of all the image assets, of all the um, website assets any website uh, on the internet has now. It's because users want to consume images and also we have more and more high powerful devices now that have very, very good screens. So it does not suffice to ship low resolution images anymore. Images just need to get bigger to keep up with our bigger screens. And um, this has a couple of consequences we also learned. That is, A, um, images are huge in terms of byte size compared to all the other assets. Um, and we, they also, because they're so big and because they, there's a decoding cost to these heavy images, they have strong correlations to overall page load time, speed index, visually ready, all these metrics that tell us, is our site loading fast enough for our users? So we, we learned not only do we, uh, do we face the fact that we need to compress images, now we also need to take into consideration that images are not standalone. They're embedded in a SOMA in, in, in midst JavaScript and CSS, and their size and decoding performance has an impact on all of these other assets. So it's something we also needed to take into consideration. So, like I said, this brought us to three major things that we wanted to tackle. We wanted to learn, A, how to optimize our images better. We wanted to learn how to deliver our images faster, and we wanted to learn how to render our images more beautifully so that they are more appealing to our users faster and make them sticky, don't make them bounce, get them emotionally engaged into what they were seeing. Um, if, you, if you read through these three, you will realize, of course, and if you're a little experienced with image optimization, that there are cross-side effects to each of these, right? I cannot talk about image optimization without also talking a little bit about image delivery, and I can't talk about decent image delivery without affecting image render. But for argument's sake today, let's look at one after the other so that we can keep things clear. So, optimization first. This, if it plays, yes, is a... Um, animated GIF that shows you the impact of JPEG quality on byte size. So just for the extreme sake, I started at quality of 1, and I ended up with the uh, default quality of 100. Uh, so the, the highest quality of 100, it's a linear scale for a libjpeg. And on the right-hand side, you can see the overall byte size. So when you, can, when you correlate these two, you actually realize that while quality in theory should be a linear scale, what it actually means in terms of byte size is an exponential growth. So images get much, much, much bigger as you go for higher quality. Um, we, uh, we also know that um, we have a, a bad history with image quality. So for example, when libjpeg came out, the engineers had to set some kind of default value for which uh, output, output quality a JPEG should have. So they, go to the, so they went for 85. And 85 in libjpeg does not mean 85 in another JPEG encoder, but 85 then cascaded throughout the entire industry as a standard way of compressing images. So if you went for Photoshop, say for web, it would always go for quality 85 for default, these kinds of things, until they shifted their scale, by the way. Um, and then later, when Google realized, like in 2007 to 2010, images are a problem, we need to optimize them, they then started just offering a compression with level 75, saying it's good enough while it's fast. So then lots of engineers just shifted from 85 to 75, but it really just shifted the problem around a little bit. It didn't answer the question, which quality does my image actually need? So. The, the correct answer would have been it. We only, as a, as, an, as a performance community, we only realized this much later, is um, the right answer to the perfect quality is automatic quality. What we needed to learn is how to adjust quality based on image contents. Because depending on how granular the contents in your images are, or if you're showing something very smooth, it might, uh, it might be that you can compress one image with a very high quality, the other one with a very low quality, while still not incurring any compression artifacts or anything that looks nasty inside the image. So automating quality is actually the way to go. But how do you go about that? So we learned that um, there is uh, there are, actually, there's an entire series of algorithms that can detect changes inside images. Um, if you only computed 
different uh, differences um, on, a, on a very agnostic level, then any encoder would basically change 99% of all the pixels I'll show you in a minute. But there are algorithms that are smarter than this, algorithms that actually might sh only calculate differences in images before and after compression um, that are also appealing to the human eye so that we can compress areas that are meaningful to us while you know, ignoring areas that the human eye doesn't care about at all anyway. This should be it, if it plays. Yes, it plays. So this is a difference map of um, how many images get touched by a lossy JPEG encoder. And as you can see, just with quality 85, it's like 95% of all the pixels. So measuring differences in images agnostically to find out how much of an image has changed before and after compression is not the smartest way to go about this. What is actually much smarter is going for salient areas inside an image. So Im areas inside an image that match, well, that match what the human eye would go for. High contrast areas with, l with high saturation, areas that the human eye gets drawn to. In this example, of course, it'll be the cushions, it'll be the apples, it'll be everything that has a distinct, significant color, like, for example, the reception area with its orange panels. These are things the human eye gets drawn to. So these are things that, uh, that we should take into consideration when doing compression. And algorithms like DSSIM, these, uh, based on the Structural Similarity Index, they can help us do that. Um, however, while DSSIM is clever enough to only calculate a difference between an input and an output image based on human vision, it's not clever enough to tell you if it still does a good job in lossy compression, because lossy compression also not just creates generalized differences, but also creates rigging artifacts that are very, very distinct to lossy compression, and humans have by now gotten, a, gotten used to them. When they see a badly compressed JPEG, they realize it's a badly compressed JPEG because they know what rigging artifacts are, even if they can't name the term. So there are algorithms based on DSSIM, and one is Cloudinary Simulacra, that actually take into consideration if a before and after comparison has created ringing artifacts around high contrast corners, which is very important to find out if you can compress the image any further. So with these tools, we were able to adjust our image quality automatically. And just in case anybody is familiar with the, with the JPEG quality scale, most of our images are now at 59, 57 quality, maybe 67. So really low compared to what was the standard a couple of years ago, because we are sure that our images still look pristine while being much, much smaller. The next thing we did to reduce file size is adopt the image format. So I've been mentioning JPEG exclusively by now, for now, but since 2010-11, actually, companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple have pushed for more modern image formats because JPEG is from 1995. Um, and so they thought, with our engineering power, we can build better compression algorithms that make images smaller. And so they all started their own, uh, their own image formats, WebP for, for Chrome-based, so for Blink-based browsers, JPEG 2000 from Apple, JPEG XR from Microsoft, um, and now with Apple also Heave. So we have a lot of new image formats that we can send to specific devices. Of course, you need to be clever about sending the right device to the, <laughs> the right image to the right devices, because otherwise they can't decode it. But if you do it right, you can actually leverage a lot of the benefits from more modern formats. So that brings me to the first real lesson for today. Lesson number one. Lesson number one is uh, lossy compression actually it doesn't even depend on the image format creates blurriness because it's lossy, right? It loses detailed information. So when you, when you want to make an image smaller and uh, you want to make sure that it ships fast to your users and you, you increase compression, you, you maximize compression, what happens is that the images get slightly blurry. So one lesson that we learned is we actually apply a, small, a slight sharpening filter that you can see in action here if you do the before and after comparison. See, we apply a light, light sharpening factor and then compress the image and what happens is the output image, although it's still very small, actually looks far more pristine than if, if without doing this. So the images still look sharp and crisp and like you want to consume more of them and not blurry and ugly, but, and they still benefit from the file size reduction, um, but they don't suffer from that blurriness in uh, cost anymore. Um, this also helps if you take into account that you have no control over where your users consume images. 
right? So right now you're sitting in a dark room, depending on if you were kind or not, your brightness setting is high or low. Maybe some of you already have a night filter on because you want to take a nap. So you as a, as a web developer or as anybody caring about image optimization, you don't have control over the lighting situations people consume images in. So making sure that images are at the at the high end of extreme saturation, extreme sharpness is actually good because it might be that people view them in low lighting situations or in very, very bright sunlight. So you need to take into, consider into consideration how people, how people consume these images and how you need to optimize for that. That brings me also to lesson two, and that is saturation improvements. So that's the second part we figured. Um, and by the way, when I mentioned these lessons, every one of these has been qualified against our business data. So this is not something we as the tech team draw forward and we went like, yeah, this is nice, we're going to take this. We've qualified a positive impact on business KPIs for each of these steps. That's just an important thing to highlight. This is saturation improvement, also positive for us. Um, we found that when we increased uh, contrast and saturation and basically did all basic histogram optimizations on the images, we had a far better conversion rate and also people consumed more images inside galleries. Why is that? Because with 47 million images, we don't have unique control over all the images that we ship. Our hoteliers do, right? The people who own the hotels. So some of them take shitty photos. So we need to take care that even the bad photos look nice. And for that, we have like, you know, the magic wand on the iPhone where you press magic wand and the image looks nice. That's basically this at scale. And lesson three for that. Um, we also thought we should really check out do our users, especially on mobile, enjoy if an image is faster rather than good looking? Because as a performance engineer, I always thought speed always wins. I always thought if something renders faster, even if it's a little more compressed, people will appreciate this because they get the content faster. But there's actually a, uh, a drop off in this. So we found that when we compressed images uh, significantly, like you can see here in the before and after comparison, um, people reacted negatively to this. They stopped consuming that much content in the galleries. They stopped converting that well. So not like 100%, but you, it's noticeable. It was measurable enough over time. So we learned that although people probably couldn't, couldn't phrase the term compression artifact or ringing artifact or noise or any of these terms, they knew that something was wrong with the image. They knew that something was less appealing than it was before, and therefore their behavior changed slightly. So we had to actually fine-tune that we never go below a certain quality, because we knew that our users would not consume the content that we wanted them to consume that much anymore. Right, that concludes optimization efforts. So let's quickly talk about delivery, because delivery is uh, not that big. It's interesting, though. So one thing, for example, that we learned is um, global delivery really matters for us. So if you have a global audience, being close to your users with image assets was really important to us. So what we measured was how is our CDN, our content delivery network, doing globally? And we found that for several markets, um, the latency to image delivery was very high. And we wondered why is that? And we realized our current CDN provider did not have POPs, points of presence in these countries that matter to us. So, of course, in the main markets, they were established, but in emerging markets, which matter to us, they were not established. So they had high latency images, came in slower people in these, in these areas, consumed less images, fewer images, um, and they also converted less. So we realized we had to change something. So we switched CDN providers, got, went for a CDN provider that was superior to this, and made sure that their caches are warm for our images that we ship to them. And that really made a huge impact into how our users, especially in emerging markets, consumed images. Brings me to lesson four, that delivery speed matters. It really does. So that slow loading images like here in this animation, um, they harm the user experience. So we did, we tr of course, we tried to indicate to the user, yes, there's an image coming with a placeholder that you see there, but it does, it's not the same as getting the image or getting a preview of the image. The placeholder basically indicates to the user, here is something that's not complete, and that increases friction, the cognitive load. So people actually have a higher effort to consume that content because their brain keeps telling them that something is not complete yet. So they see the placeholder and they go, this is, this is wrong. So they wait for this. So like they have idle cycles in their brain until the placeholder gets replaced with the real thing. And everybody hates to wait. So the showing the placeholders for, for regions where images weren't fast wasn't a good option. We needed to make sure that images could come in as fast as possible. 
Um, one thing that we learned from that as well is uh, we started pre-warming all our caches, both for the transformations and for global delivery on the CDN. Pre-warming caches with transformations on images was really important to us to make sure that our users have the best, best experience and we don't have to wait for two weeks for a new image transformation to actually start making an impact for our users. And lesson five, and that is the first big one that I find very, very interesting. Who of you is familiar with the Intersection Observer? Intersection Observer, JavaScript? For lazy loading? Yeah, okay. Intersection Observer API, um, by now almost centered in all the browsers. Um, it's used to performantly compute what is in the viewport and what not. And um, lots and lots of front-end engineers now go, yay, we finally have a native API to know what's in the viewport of the browser so we can do lazy loading right. So lots of companies now apply lazy loading to their product overview lists to make sure that they don't load too many images and only load the images when they get close to the, user, to the user's viewport. That is a, a valiant effort, and that is also why companies like Google drive the intersection observer forward across browsers. But the interesting thing that we found is, depending on consumption, intersection observer or any kind of lazy loading technique is actually harmful to UX. Because what happens is, if on mobile especially, users tend to flick scroll. So they land on a product overview list, sh imagine yourself shopping on Amazon, and you don't, you don't see the right product right, of, for right away, so you do a flick scroll. And f the problem with flick scrolling on mobile is, you have no idea where the user ends up, right? It might be 300 pixels down, it might be 900 pixels down, depending on how thick your thumb is. So, you, and if they are, if they are in, a, in a mobile network, and if, especially if they are in a medium to poor mobile network, what happens is, intersection observer then queues the images for download, but they don't come in fast enough. So users are exposed to a couple of seconds of a product overview list without images. And that, again, increases cognitive load, increases friction. Users hate it. So we actually found that for network connections that are fast enough, it is actually superior in terms of consumption of, of content to load some of the images synchronously, even if they're not in the viewport yet. So the all-in on intersection observer that we're currently experiencing in the web developer community is actually not a silver bullet. You should not always lazy load everything. It, de it's, it depends. The, the honest answer to everything in the world is it depends. Okay, lesson six is also um, the other extreme again is don't always load everything synchronously. So when we found out that Intersection Observer didn't necessarily um, convert users better all the time because we weren't downloading everything, we thought maybe we should also test loading everything, for example, for a single image gallery um, at once. So if a user opens a gallery, maybe they indicate to us they want to consume the gallery, so let's load all the images. The thing is, though, that if you load all the images inside a gallery and there might be 30, 40, 50 images in there, Users' devices have a lot of work to do, and again, if they're on poor networks, they actually don't like this. So we found that this, again, reduced, con reduced consumption inside the galleries, reduced overall interaction with everything because users' devices got bucked, bogged down with all these image requests, which they might not even need because maybe they don't complete all the images in the gallery. So we basically did a binary search, finding out which is the ideal image uh, um, amount that you should preload for a gallery. Because if you preload zero images, what happens is a user clicks on the next image, sees the placeholder, and has to wait for the request to finish. They hate it, they, they drop. So that's a problem for them. So we figured out what is the best, what is the best way to do this. And the, uh, the amount of images that is ideal, what we found out after the, our binary search endeavors is five images is the truth. Because um, Chrome, for example, still limits itself, and most browsers limit themselves to five or six H uh, concurrent HTTP requests. So if you want to fill an image gallery and make sure users consume as much of the gallery as possible, you need to respect their bandwidth, but you also must load enough that they can consume it quickly. So and we found that five images is, is ideal for that. And that concludes delivery and brings me to rendering. Rendering was, uh, was actually one of the funniest ones that we tested. Um, so one of the problems, like I mentioned, is we don't control our inventory in terms of images because the hoteliers do. So some of them upload images that are very, very, very tall or very, very, very wide. And we found that our previous cropping mechanisms were not ideal. They just center cropped, like in this image. And so this is the original and, the, and our cropped result. And users were wondering, what is this? Is this the bathroom? Is this a spa? What am I seeing here? Because they, they, they lost too much context. And we realized we had to do something about our cropping. 
So what we what we optimized for here is a is a smarter cropping that actually takes aspect ratios into account. Looks like this. Um, if you see here, you see an if else condition in a URL. Pretty crazy, right? So we have if else conditions that take care of our aspect ratio. Now because we don't control the inventory, we need to control it in the front end. And since we don't want to download an image to find out its its uh, aspect ratio and dimensions to then maybe discard it, we need to do it a smarter way, right? We don't want to waste our users' bandwidth. So what we're doing here is if else in the URL, um, this is done with Cloudinary, and we also we we swap the cropping mechanism depending on the aspect size of the image, without hogging our users' bandwidth. Now if our gallery or if any kind of product view requires that the pixel dimensions st stay accurate. So for example, again, original and the poorly cropped one, then there's another thing that we can do, and that is we do saliency detection to enhance our cropping. This is, uh, this is excellent for automated art direction. So in responsive images where you can ship lots of different sizes of the same image and you need to make sure that the image always shows the most relevant part of the image, we actually have a saliency mapper there that identifies, yeah, there's an area with lots of saturation, high contrast, high sharpness. Um, this is probably the area the human eye will be drawn to. So the auto cropping crops onto that area instead of the brown wall that doesn't tell the user anything. And yeah, that's the uh, that's the... Um, the gravity auto, yes. So the, we, this is again a cloudinary feature called gravity to center on these areas of interest. Oh, come on, switch. Yes. And then um, another thing that we found very, very curious is um, on because of the rise of mobile in the last 10 years, we have, ten, we, we have started to forget um, that at one point in the past, images matched exactly the viewport that they were meant for. We gotten used to the fact that with, I don't know, 10,000, 15,000 different sizes of mobile screens, you will, images are always just what we call liquid rescaled to the current device size. But what we found is that um, at least on desktop, you can do a better job. And uh, the result is that the images look crisper. If you, I mean, on this projector, it's a little hard. But if you look at the, for example, the age of the text on the wall and the textile on the on the rope, you will see that the right hand image actually looks a little crisp, and that is because it's a pixel by pixel match for the CSS and HTML container that it that it uh, that it fits into. While the left hand side is a DPI2 image, so a double density image for Retina devices that had to be liquid rescaled by the browser to fit its to fit the to fit the HTML element, and. So what we ended up doing is, for desktop, we actually ship pixel-perfect sizes because they look crisper. They don't get the bicubic filtering of a liquid resize. It also prevents the unnecessary paint events on desktop, so the desktop size renders a little faster. And that actually helps us show our, show our images as clearly and crisply as possible. And, uh, oh yeah, that is an interesting one. This brings me to the next lesson, lesson 10, and that is, um, I mentioned that we shipped lots of different custom image formats, right, to make sure that we ship the smallest possible image while it still looks okay. Um, we found out that one of them sucks. And uh, one of them is the Microsoft format. Who is surprised now? Um, it's <laughs> it was JPEG XR. So we found out that um, JPEG XR, so users on Internet Explorer and Edge were actually not doing so well, although we were making such a huge effort to ship, to ship images as fast as possible. They were actually converting a little less and we were wondering why that is until we realized it's the image format. JPEG XR was originally meant as a replacement for um, HDR capable images of, um, by a company in 2012 that was bought by Microsoft. So it was never really meant to, do, uh, to be a fast delivered image format. It was, to, it was meant as an archival image format, but Microsoft included it into the browser. And um, they didn't do a very good job with it because they only based the decoder on the CPU. They were not using any GPU. So um, what happens if you include a lot of JPEG XR images is what you see on the right hand side. Basically the CPU, uh, the CPU spikes for decode double and if you have an application like a single page application with lots of JavaScript that already uses a lot of for CPU cycles at uh, application startup, actually the uh, JPEG XR images start to compete for uh, decode resources, for CPU resources with JavaScript, CSS and re rendering and layout. So that was a really, really, really bad discovery for us. So we switched off JPEG XR with we're shipping standard JPEG again. And now that Microsoft with Edge at least is switching to Blink Engine, we can start shipping JPEG, WebP. So JPEG XR is not that big of a loss. 
Um, when we realized that we had problems with one of the image formats, we also thought maybe we should test just shipping JPEGs to everybody and finding out if the entire image format switch is even worth it or if we can get away with shipping one image form because it makes caching easier and all these kinds of things. So we, we also did a test of, of only shipping normal JPEGs from 1995 and we found out actually that it was behaving rather neutral for us. We were wondering why is that? So with Cloudinary's help, um, we analyzed how uh, image decode happens on the CPU. So these are graphs comparing um, the megabytes decoded on a single CPU core by image format. And what you can see is that because JPEG comes from a time where CPUs were far less powerful, it doesn't create a, a huge spike, but it, it decodes over time. While modern image formats like WebP, JPEG 2000, they come from, an, from a more modern time where they are aware that, that there's far more CPU power available. So they basically create decode spikes like this. So what we found is that because we are a JavaScript heavy single page application, CPU is actually a bottleneck for us. And if we have tons of WebP images that hu create huge CPU spikes at application startup, we lose the benefit of the file size savings we have from WebP. So yes, WebP was smaller to compress for us on Chrome, for Chrome browsers, but because WebP was heavier to decode, we were losing it again if we were shipping too much of it. So what, what, we, what ended up is that we found out that JPEG versus all other image formats was actually business neutral for us, which I found very, very interesting because this is something that nobody expects. Um, that, because we found out that JPEG was neutral, led us to another interesting problem, and that is image previews. Um, who's aware of progressive JPEGs? Cool. Wow, a couple of old people. Good. Um, so progressive JPEGs are actually have a special kind of JPEG that basically comes in several layers and the first layer gives you a blurry preview but it comes in really early. So if you use a progressive JPEG, it, it means that your users get to see some kind of preview of an image earlier if you do things right. Um, in 2016 with Cloudinary, I built something that is called OPJPEG, Optimized Progressive JPEGs, that makes sure that the first scan layer, you see the pixelated version there, uh, actually is already meaningful because in baseline, in, in standard JPEGs generated by libjpeg, the first scan layer was often black and white or purple or complete gibberish. So with optimized progressive JPEGs, you at least get some kind of preview of the image. So since we had this technology in place, now we wanted to test what does this do for our users. And um, another piece fell into the, another puzzle piece fell into place. And that is, um, again, with uh, Akamai and uh, Cloudinary and my help, we built something that's called HTTP2 priority streams for JPEGs. So what we do is, we, in HTTP2, you can send a server-side um, prioritization list saying these assets are more important than others. And you, if you do this for progressive JPEGs, you can send that first pixelated scan layer with a high priority flag, and then it gets downloaded as quickly as possible. So for, for images that are above the fold in the initial render, this is very, very cool to show previews of images early. So we thought this is the decode graph for this, the visual complete graph for this. Um, the, if, as you can see, the green one wins, and that's the one where HTTP2 prioritizes the progressive JPEG. Um, we realized this would be really cool for our users to not see the gray placeholders anymore, but actually see a meaningful preview. But that actually ended up bringing us to lesson 12. And lesson 12 is, while progressive JPEGs are cool, and I love them, um, they suck in single page applications. And they do that because single page applications uh, manipulate the DOM all the time. You see here how some of the items keep switching. And that is because we keep manipulating the DOM based on what current pricing information we have for each of these hotels. So we throw away complete items and their images out of the DOM and we put new ones in. And what happens is the browser, um, the browser has to identify that a new image tag has been put into the DOM. It needs to put this into the downloader queue. The downloader queue needs to download it. The downloader queue needs to, needs to inform the rendering queue that the image is complete enough for rendition. Then it gets rendered onto the screen. That is an entire food chain of what happens there in the background. And the problem seems to be that um, the downloader queue does not inform the renderer queue that a progressive JPEG is already far enough to be rendered. By the time a progressive JPEG in a single page application with DOM manipulation gets rendered, it's already at scan layer four out of five, at which point it looks complete to the user. So the entire preview effort that we thought they would bring to us was lost. That really made us very sad. 
So and that brought that brought us to the next phase of our preview um, endeavors, and that is squibs. Um, squibs are vector-based previews that I helped build in 2016, 17, and um, the way they work is that you generate a uh, low resolution preview of an, of an image and then you calculate uh, SVG blobs from them. So a couple of uh, circles, a couple of rectangles. You color them in the predominant colors from those areas inside the image. And then you use Gaussian blur to make sure that the preview looks as if it was about to be the real image. That is the trick behind it. The nice thing is, as you can see in the byte size counts, actually the byte size stays the same, but because it's SVG, it ben benefits from GZIP or Broadly compression. And uh, it renders really nicely and it has no problems with high DPI screens because, again, it's a vector image. So that is the next technology that we use to make sure that um, our users would see any kind of preview image instead of gray placeholders. That is the effect you can see here when we're scrolling. So here we actually inject the squib-based placeholder exactly when the text appears. So our users are engaged sooner. They see some kind of visual information alongside with the text. They, uh, the, the result was that they bounce less, that they feel more engaged, and then we replace that with a nice CSS animation with a high-resolution image as soon as it's ready. So we're generating our own preview images now. That works really, really well for us. So that brings me to takeaways. This was a lot, 12 lessons. Takeaways was we covered optimization of images, we covered delivery of images, and rendering of images. And they were all based on the real test, uh, test results that we had at Trivago. So I thought about how can I sum this up in one sentence so you can take that away even after your tiresome lunch break. And that is, if you want to do things right, make sure that you show the right stuff and make sure that you show it fast and beautifully. I think that is the, that is the best takeaway I can give you today. Make sure that it's right, make sure that it's fast, make sure that it's beautiful. So if you like all that content that I've shown here today, Travago has a tech blog available under techtravago.com. We're going to publish this as a series soon of image optimization. There are tons of other resources from anything or from design grids to um, auto-scaling Kubernetes clusters. So this is a really, really nice resource. You might want to hook up, um, follow it, put it into your RSS reader, whichever way you consume that content. And by the way, if you're ever in Düsseldorf, Germany, feel free to hit me up. I'll gladly give you a tour of our beautiful Trivago campus and we can talk some more image optimization there. Um, and in case you like the campus, because it's really pretty, maybe you want to work for us. This is our job openings at jobstravago.com. Thank you very much.